Hi, this is Algebra 2, Lesson 32. We're going to talk about the quotient theorem for square roots, congruency, and congruent triangles. We're starting on page 145. Okay, so we've talked about the product theorem for square roots, <clears throat> excuse me, which is if we have the square root of 3 times 2, that equals the square root of 3 times the square root of 2. A similar rule applies to the square root of a quotient or fraction. The square root of a quotient can be written as the quotient of the square roots. The, so the square root of 3 halves equals the square root of 3 over the square root of 2. And you remember when we're dealing with square roots in a fraction, we want to rationalize the denominator for our final answer. So instead of leaving this as the square root of 3 over the square root of 2, we're going to multiply the top and the bottom times the square root of 2. And on the top we will have the square root of 6. And on the bottom we're going to have 2, because that's the square root of 2 times the square root of 2. And that will be your final answer. Okay, let's try this one. Simplify the square root of 3 7 so we know that the square root of 3 7 is going to equal the square root of 3 over the square root of 7. And now we need to get rid of the radical in the denominator. So we're going to multiply both sides, the top and the bottom, by the square root of 7. On the top we have the square root of 3 times the square root of 7, which is the square root of 21, over the square root of 7 times the square root of 7, which is 7. And there's nothing we can do to that. There are no prime roots that we can pull out of 21. So it just stays in that form. Let's try another one. Simplify the square root of 2 fifths plus the square root of 5 halves. So we can rewrite this as the square root of 2 over the square root of 5 plus the square root of 5 over the square root of 2. For this fraction, we're going to multiply the top and bottom by 5, or the square root of 5. In this one, we're going to multiply the top and bottom times the square root of 2. So if on this side, we have the square root of 10 over 5. And here we have the square root of 10 over 2. Now to add these together, we need to find a common denominator, which is going to be 10. So we're going to multiply <clears throat> this side by 2 over 2, and this side by 5 over 5, so we have a common denominator. So this is going to be 2 times the square root of 10 plus 5 times the square root of 10 equals 10, because the radicals here are the same we can add these together. So our answer is going to be 7 times the square root of 10 over 10. Okay. Here's another one. Simplify 3 times, that's a 3 under there, the square root of 3 7 minus 5 times the square root of 7 thirds. Okay, so we can rewrite this as 3 times the square root of 3 times the square root of 7 minus 5 times the square root of 7 times the square root of 3. If it helps, if it makes life less confusing, you can put this 3 on the top in the numerator and the 5 in the numerator. If having a number out in front makes this a little more confusing. So this equals 3 times the square root of 3 over the square root of 7 minus 5 times the square root of 7 over the square root of 3. Okay, now we need to get rid of the radicals in the new, uh, denominators. So we're going to multiply this one times the square root of 7 over the square root of 7 and this one times the square root of 3 over the square root of 3. So on the top here we're going to have 3 times the square root of 21 over 7 minus 
5 times the square root of 21 all over 3. And now we need to find the common denominator. The least common multiple of 7 and 3 is going to be 21. So we're going to multiply this one times 3 over 3 and this one times 7 over 7 which will give us 3 times 3 is 9 over 21 over 21 minus 5 times 7 is 35 times the square root of 21 over 21 okay uh, 9 minus 35 is 26 negative 26 times the square root of 21 over 21 which is ugly but correct okay here's another one simplify 2 times the square root of 2 sevenths minus 5 times the square root of 7 halves. Okay, we're going to set it up the same way. We'll have 2 times the square root of 2 over the square root of 7 minus 5 times the square root of 7 over the square root of 2. We're going to multiply this side, top and bottom, times the square root of 7 to get rid of the radical in the denominator. We're going to multiply this one times the square root of 2 to get rid of the radical in the denominator. So this is going to equal 2 times the square root of 7 times the square root of 2 is the square root of 14 minus oops, all over 7 minus 5 times the square root of 7 times the square root of 2 is the square root of 14 all over 2. Right now we need to find a common, the least common multiple. In, in this case, we've got 7 and 2, so it's going to be 14. So we're going to multiply this side by 2 over 2, this side by 7 over 7. And we will have 4 over 14, I mean 4 times the square root of 14 over 14, minus 35 times the square root of 14 over 14. So now we have, oop, that's a 35, not a 3. 35 minus 4 is 31, so this is going to be negative 31 times the square root of 14 all over 14. There's nothing we can simplify in the fraction. There's nothing more we can pull out of the square root of 14, so that is your final answer. We're going to talk about congruency. In mathematics, only numbers are considered equal. So 4 equals 2 plus 2 is a true equation because all of the terms are numbers. When we're talking about line segments, we're going to call them congruent. The congruent means the numbers that we use to describe their lengths are equal. So we can say the measurement of line segment AB equals the measurement of line segment CB or we can say that line segment AB is congruent to line segment CD. D. Remember, if we put the line on top, that means line segment. And if we leave the line segment off the top, it means the measurement of the line segment. So this means the measurement of, lay, of line segment AB, and this means AB itself. When we're talking about measures of angles, we can do it the same way. We can say the measurement of angle A equals the measurement of angle B. Or we can say that angle A is congruent to angle B. If the measures of the angles in one polygon are equal to the measures of the angles in the other polygon, 
and the sides opposite have equal lengths, then the polygons are congruent. So we have two triangles here, and we see that the, this angle has two hash marks, and this angle has two hash marks. So these angles are, the measures of these two angles are equal, or these two angles are congruent. We see that angle C is congruent to angle D, and angle E is congruent to angle B. We see that the line, the side EF, is congruent to the line AB. And the side DE is congruent to the side BC. And the side DE is congruent to the side AC. So because the measurements of the angles and the sides are equal, these two angles are congruent, or these two triangles are congruent. So we could say triangle ABC is congruent to triangle DEF. When we write statements of congruency, we have to be careful to write the corresponding angle letters in the same order. Having said that, I need to make sure I did that correctly. So, angle A is actually congruent to angle F. So this is not a true statement. Angle A triangle, sorry, triangle ABC is actually congruent to A is uh, corresponding to F. F, B is corresponding to E, and C is corresponding to D. So angle ABC is congruent to triangle FED. It is not congruent to DEF. Okay, on page 148 in your book, it talks about congruent angles that are rotated and reflected, and it seemed reasonable, instead of trying to write all this out and draw it again, because my drawing skills are not all that good, we're just going to look at the book. So, we can do three things to triangles to show that they are congruent. We can slide them, which means the angles are in the same position and we just slide one over the top of each other, figuratively speaking. So we have triangle ABC and we have triangle DEF and the A corresponds to D and the B is congruent to E and C is congruent to F. Therefore, all of these triangles are in the, all these angles and sides are in the same order and we could, if we cut these two out of the book, we could just slide this one on top of this one to show that they are congruent. A fancier word for that is translate. So we're just moving it from this position to this position without changing the orientation in any way. So we're translating these triangles. The next one, here we have angle ABC and we have angle DEF. And you see the E is congruent to B. And we can tell by looking that D is congruent to A and C obviously is the same point. So it's congruent to itself. In this case, we're just going to rotate the angle from this position down to this position, or you can rotate this angle up so that the sides match. If this side matches this side, then this side will match this side, and C will be on top of each other. So this is called rotating. Sometimes it's necessary to flip an angle to make it fit. So here we have angle X and angle B, but we see that their opposite sides are facing away from each other, which means Y is going to equal, is going to be congruent to A, and C is going to be congruent to Z. And if we just slide this, it's not going to be correct. If we rotate it, this is going to be on top, 
instead of the, instead of the C being on top. So we need to actually flip it. So this is called uh, reflection. So we're going to make a reflection across an imaginary line. So it was facing this way and now it'll be facing this way. So just like the reflection in a mirror. So we have translate where we're just we're just sliding it from one place on top of another one. We have rotate where everything is in the same order. We're just moving it up. And we have reflection where we're actually going to flip it over. Okay? The point of this is that you need to be careful when you're working with these that you find the sides that are opposite the congruent angles to work with. Sometimes it's really tricky. Okay? So you're going to be, that's going to be telling you these two triangles are congruent, so find the length of this side, or one side is going to be 4x minus 7. So you're going to have to find out the what the x equals. So you're going to need to know which sides correspond to the other sides. And that's where you're going to either use translation or rotation or reflection. Watch carefully for the congruent angles and their opposite sides. Okay, so congruent triangles are similar triangles whose scale factor is 1. If two triangles are congruent, the measure of their corresponding angles and sides are equal. Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So here's an example. We need to find X and P. We see that this angle is congruent to this angle, and this angle is congruent to this angle. And if these two angles are equal, that means that this angle has to be equal to this angle. So if all of the angles are congruent, we're actually going to call this an AAA triangle. That means that all three of the angles are equal. Because this angle, because the side opposite this angle is equal to the side opposite this angle and these two angles are congruent, that means we have an AAAS and if this side, if the angles are congruent and the corresponding angle, even one corresponding angle is equal, that means the whole triangle is congruent. So if we have three angles plus one side that are congruent, the whole angle is, the whole triangle is congruent to the other one. So we will call this an AAAS triangle. You're going to do a lot of these kind of proofs in geometry if you haven't done geometry already. Okay, since these two triangles are congruent, we know that the other corresponding sides are also equal. So we can say that P equals 4x plus 1. And these two angles are going to be equal, so 6x plus 2 equals 12x minus 4. Okay? We're going to start with this side and solve for x, and then we can use the x to solve for p. So if x, 6x plus 2 equals 12x plus 4, we can subtract 6x from both sides and add 4 to both sides to get the x's all by themselves. So that's going to cancel and that's going to cancel. We have a 6 here. 12 minus 6 is 6. So 6 equals 6x. We're going to divide both sides by 6. And x equals 1. If x equals 1, then p equals 4 times 1 plus 1. So p equals 4 plus 1 and p equals 5. Okay? That's how you're going to use the trans translation, reflection, and rotation. This one was an easy one. It was just a translation. So this angle equals this angle, this angle equals this angle, this angle equals this angle. So we could have cut this out and just set it right on top. Some of the problems they're going to give you, they're going to be either rotated or they're going to be flipped. So you're going to have to look carefully to see which angles go 
with the corresponding angles and which sides go with which sides. Okay? So take your time, do the problems carefully, and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.